God, who is almighty, all wise, and all divine, chose only one thing to manifest his power, his wisdom, and his divinity, namely the Holy Eucharist, says St. Augustine, a renowned theologian and doctor of the Church, who has left an indelible mark of his scholarship on the teaching of the Church. The Holy Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life, in which lie hidden the mystery of the Passion, Death, and Resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. One needs to understand each and every aspect of the Eucharist in order to know the deeper meaning and implication of this mystery and to grow closer to Jesus who is present therein. Christianity upholds Sunday as the day of the Lord because it is the day that the Lord has made holy. After the creation of the universe in six days, the Lord rested on the seventh day and made it holy. All the four evangelists record that Jesus rose on Sunday. The reason Lord appeared to various people on Sundays. The Holy Spirit descended on the apostles on a Sunday. The early Christians gathered together to break the bread and to read the scriptures on Sundays. In short, Sunday is a mini Easter and the faithful gathered together around one table of the Lord to be nourished on His Word and His Body. Hence, participating in the Sunday Eucharist is obligatory to every Christian and absenting oneself from this obligation intentionally is considered as sin. Out of the seven sacraments, the third sacrament is known as the Holy Eucharist. Jesus instituted this sacrament while at table with His disciples to partake His Last Supper. Hence, the words uttered during Mass and the acts performed are based on the biblical account of the Last Supper. Let us discover the deep meaning of all these words, signs, symbols, and gestures. The Holy Eucharist begins when the faithful desire to go for Mass as they hear the church bells toll. Hence, the journey from the house of the faithful to the church premises is the entrance procession of the Holy Eucharist. The church bells remind the faithful that during this procession, they are expected to prepare themselves wholeheartedly for the Mass. As we come to the entrance of the church, we take a few drops of holy water from the baptismal font and sign ourselves with the sign of the cross. This gesture has a twofold meaning. The first meaning takes us back to the times when the Israelites crossed the river Jordan as they entered the Holy Land. Later on, it was in this river that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. As the Christian believer enters the church, the New Jerusalem, he is reminded of his baptism by water. The second meaning is connected with the Jewish custom of washing one's feet before entering the temple and thus it reminds the faithful of the need for purification of heart before entering into a holy place. The faithful come to the church to meet the King of Kings a Lord of Lords in the Eucharist. Hence, it is strongly recommended that they silently prepare themselves by spending time before the Lord, setting aside all their worries. In this way, they dispose themselves well to receive grace from the Eucharistic Lord. As the celebrant and the altar servers come to the altar in procession, people join in the entrance hymn and welcome Jesus in the form of the celebrant. This procession reminds the faithful of their pilgrim status, indicating that they are only travelers in this world. Their final destination is heaven. The celebrant makes a deep bow before the altar and kisses it. This kiss is the symbol of love, intimacy, and union with God. When the celebrant offers Jesus' sacrifice on the altar, this very altar becomes the symbol of Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary. It is through this sacrifice that human beings are saved. It is from this altar that we receive spiritual nourishment. 
then the celebrant incenses the altar one of the things that the magi had offered baby jesus was incense it is the symbol of prayer and fragrant life it is a sign of turning to god and to our fellow brothers and sisters hence on solemnities and feast days we incense the altar the celebrant begins the mass with the sign of the cross and greets the congregation saying the lord be with you it reminds the faithful that they are called by god to share in the mystery of salvation it is expected of the faithful that they experience the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god our father and the communion of the holy spirit after the greetings the celebrant introduces the theme of the day's liturgy in which he explains the significance of the day or the life of a saint this helps people to know the theme of the mass at the end of the introduction the faithful are invited to recall their sins and to ask god's pardon and mercy all pause for a while in silence and introspect in the i confess the celebrant and the faithful ask mother mary and the saints to intercede for them so that they are forgiven their sins in the lord have mercy christ have mercy and lord have mercy again there is a plea to god for forgiveness the figure 3 here is a symbol of total forgiveness from the lord the celebrant says the prayer of absolution if the rite of sprinkling is used the penitential rite is omitted this sprinkling of the holy water reminds the faithful of their baptism and the union which is brought about in and through the eucharistic celebration this rite can be performed during mass on every sunday the gloria is sung on every sunday except the seasons of lent and advent it is also sung on feasts and on solemnities it reminds us of the gloria sung by the angels at the birth of jesus in bethlehem in and through this hymn the church praises the holy trinity the liturgy of the word begins after the opening prayer which is called the collect the first reading is generally from the old testament except in easter season where the first reading is from the history of the early church after the first reading the responsorial psalm is either read or sung from the lectionary the second reading is proclaimed after the responsorial psalm it is generally taken from the letters of the apostles paul peter john jude james etc this is followed by the acclamation the faithful show reverence to the lord who is about to speak to them through the gospel and join in singing the hallelujah this hallelujah is omitted in the season of lent as the faithful are in the spirit of penance however hallelujah should be always sung and never recited the gospel from one of the four canonical gospels namely matthew for the liturgical year a mark for year b luke for year c and john for feast days and solemnities is read either by the priest or the deacon who is assisting at the mass before reading the gospel he signs himself with the sign of the cross on his forehead on his lips on his chest and so do the faithful indicating prayer for purity of thoughts words and feelings at the end of the gospel reading the priest or deacon kisses the book of the gospel after this the priest or the deacon gives the homily breaking the word that he has just read this homily or sermon can be given only by ordained ministers like bishops priests and deacons and never by a religious sister seminarian or a lay faithful if they have to share their experience they could do that after the post communion prayer on sundays and solemnities the apostles creed or the nicene creed is recited after the homily through the creed the faithful profess their faith in the trinitarian god and in the official teaching of the church this is followed by the prayer of the faithful 
These prayers include petitions for the universal church, the local church, the community and for those in special need. In the offertory procession, the faithful bring bread and wine to the main altar. They could also bring other gifts for the needs of the church and for the poor. These things are not kept on the main altar but near it. However, the cross and the Bible are never brought in the offertory procession. The celebrant first offers bread and then puts wine in the chalice with a few drops of water and then offers it separately. These two species are not offered together. Mixing a few drops of water into wine is an important ritual. Wine stands for the divinity of Jesus and water stands for his humanity. The priest silently prays that as Jesus participated in our humanity, may he give us the grace to participate in his divinity. After silently praying to God to accept the sacrifice which he has made on behalf of the community with humble and contrite heart, the priest washes his hands, a gesture of purifying himself before he enters into the most important moment of the consecration. Then he appeals to the faithful to pray that God may accept his and the community's sacrifice. The Eucharistic prayer is praise of God for all that he has done for the entire human race. This prayer includes many important elements of the Christian faith. After the preface, the faithful are invited to join the heavenly angels to praise God as they sing the Holy, Holy, Holy. Then begins the prayer of consecration. It is considered as the heart and core of the Eucharistic celebration. The Holy Spirit descends upon the bread and wine when the celebrant lays his hands on them. These species become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. To show reverence to this profound moment in the Eucharist, a small bell is rung. In some places, even the church bell is rung at this moment. The faithful reverently bow or kneel before the presence of Jesus in the consecrated host and wine. After the prayer of consecration, the mystery of faith is proclaimed by the faithful at the invitation of the celebrant. Through this proclamation, they express their faith in Jesus who died, rose again and will come again in the future. Hence. This proclamation is not only one of Jesus' death alone, but of his resurrection and second coming. The Eucharistic prayer continues as the celebrant now prays for the universal church, local church, for the living, the dead, pleading for the intercession of Mary, Saint Joseph and the saints. The Eucharistic prayer ends with the doxology in which the celebrants, along with the concelebrants, recite or sing through him and with him and in him. The congregation is expected only to respond to this doxology by saying or singing the Amen. After this, the congregation recites or sings the Our Father as one family. This is the most complete and unique prayer that Jesus has taught the whole humanity. It combines very well the praise of God in the first part with the needs of human beings in the second part. So far, all the prayers were addressed to God the Father. Now the addressee is Jesus himself. The exchanging of the sign of peace indicates that we should be at peace with God and with others before receiving Jesus into our hearts. The Lamb of God that follows this gesture is an example set before us by the Church of the unblemished Lamb, Jesus, who wiped out our sins by His precious blood. While the congregation recites or sings Lamb of God, the celebrant breaks the consecrated host and puts a small piece into the chalice. This reminds the faithful of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross where His body and blood were separated. Now they are united once again, hence indicating the resurrection of Jesus. This gesture also implies the union of the local church with the universal church. 
the celebrant lifts up the broken bread and invites the faithful to the supper of the lord at which the faithful express their unworthiness of receiving jesus in their hearts on account of their sinfulness these words are taken from the gospel account of the healing of the centurion's servant at the time of receiving the holy communion each communicant is expected to say amen loudly and clearly indicating faith in the real presence of jesus in the sacred host and showing that he or she is accepting jesus as his or her personal savior after the post communion prayer the celebrant blesses the people in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit the dismissal recalls jesus's act of sending his disciples on the mission the eucharistic celebration does not end with the final hymn it only invites them to reflect on how best they could translate the devotional disposition into action in this sense the mass continues even after the hymn is over hence it is highly recommended that we spend some time in the church thanking the eucharistic lord who has come into our life and relishing a deeper union with him so that with saint paul we can say i now no longer live christ my lord lives in me yes it is christ who lives in me